In August of 1846, a ship from Havana, Cuba, carved its way through the waters of the Gulf of Mexico, bound for Veracruz. On board was a man who was convinced that he would be the savior of his country. He was the exiled former president of Mexico, Antonio Lopez de Santana. The Mexican government of Mariano Paredes had just fallen, and Santa Ana's supporters were clamoring for his return. We need a general, a general who would be able to organize an army without money, who has enough, let's say it in whatever way, charisma to attract soldiers and get them to fight without pay, without training, without anything, and who is able to unite certain groups. Earlier that year, Santana had sent a confidential agent to U.S. President James K. Polk with a surprising proposal. If Polk would allow him to pass through the U.S. blockade of Mexico, Santa Ana would try to bring about the sale of California to the United States. The terms of the offer were vague, and Santa Ana was still hated in the United States by those who remembered the Alamo and Goliath. But in spite of his doubts, Polk agreed to the proposal. When you face Santa Ana with Polk, you're facing one opportunist with another. They're, they both have that characteristic as a part of their makeup. And if Santa Ana was returning to Mexico without any clear idea of what he was going to do, Polk was using Santa Ana deliberately to gain something that he had not been able to gain any other way, that is, negotiations with Mexico. Of course, what he did not foresee was that Santa Ana would rally his people. This was the danger, but Polk didn't realize what a danger it was. In Veracruz, Santa Ana greeted the small crowd that had gathered to welcome him home. Mexicanos, there was once a day you called me the soldier of the people. Allow me to assume that title again and to devote myself until death to the defense of liberty and to the independence of the Republic. The homecoming was uneasy. Not two years earlier, Santa Ana's abuse of presidential power had caused an angry mob to smash his statue, exhume the leg he had lost to war, and drag it through the streets of Mexico City. Now, there were already rumors that Santa Ana might have made a deal with Polk. Even so, Santa Ana had become the only leader who could unite the country and stop the U.S. invasion. In December of 1846, just three months after his return from exile, he was elected president of Mexico again. Dear father, what could have possessed you to send me way off here? Your notions of military glory are altogether too exalted. There is no fun in cutting throats. I've tried it. I am obliged to mother for her advice, but it's no use to read the Bible in the midst of swords and bayonets. Either I am or that book is wrong. Anonymous letter published in Yankee Doodle. As the war with Mexico dragged on, voices of protest began to appear in U.S. newspapers, pamphlets, and magazines. Most people still supported the war, but many had expected the fighting to be over within a few months. Now, with costs and casualties mounting, opposition politicians attacked the president, denouncing what they contemptuously called Mr. Polk's War. Polk fought back, questioning the patriotism of those who criticized him. A more effectual means could not have been devised to encourage the enemy and protract the war than to advocate and adhere to their cause and thus give them aid and comfort. 
Much of the opposition came from anti-slavery forces who believed that the war was part of a southern scheme to expand slavery. Among those who opposed the president was the abolitionist leader and former slave, Frederick Douglass. The determination of our slave-holding president to prosecute the war and the probability of his success in wringing from the people men and money to carry it on is made evident by the puny opposition arrayed against him. None seem willing to take their stand for peace at all risks. Another outspoken critic of the war with Mexico was the then little-known Massachusetts writer, Henry David Thoreau. In an essay later called On Civil Disobedience, Thoreau challenged Americans to follow their conscience. When a sixth of the population of a nation which has undertaken to be a refuge of liberty are slaves, and a whole country is overrun and conquered by our foreign army and subjected to military law, I think it is not too soon for honest men to rebel and revolutionize. This people must cease to hold slaves and to make war on Mexico. But the protests of anti-war activists like Thoreau had little influence on the general public. And the embattled president now seemed more determined than ever. I declared to the cabinet that no alternative was now left but the most energetic crushing movement of our arms upon Mexico. I would not only march to the city of Mexico, but I would pursue Santa Ana's army wherever it was and capture or destroy it. Set beneath the twin volcanic peaks of Popocatépetl and Ixtaccíhuatl, Puebla de Los Ángeles, with 60,000 residents, was Mexico's second largest city. Located midway between Veracruz and the capital, Puebla was famous for its many beautiful churches. Now it found itself in the path of war. On May 15, 1847, the first U.S. troops arrived. At 12 o'clock precisely, the vanguard of the invading army entered the south gate and marched to the Grand Plaza fronting the cathedral. They stacked their arms and supplied themselves with water from a fountain, a Carolina volunteer. The streets were swarming with the multitude as far as the eye could reach. Our little army of 4,000 was completely lost in the crowds that pressed around us, examining us pretty much as they would the animals in a menagerie. Captain Kirby Smith. With the occupation of Puebla in place, Scott took the time to rest and reorganize his troops. Some took advantage of the opportunity to walk the streets of the beautiful old city. Many a New England Congregationalist or Ohio Methodist was astonished by the opulence of a Poblana church. And at Cholula, just outside Puebla, U.S. soldiers marveled at the sight of a gigantic pyramid more than a thousand years old. It was raised by the Toltec people to honor their god Quetzalcoatl. Later, the Spaniards built a Catholic church on top. Inspired by their role in what they saw as a grand historical drama, U.S. soldiers picnicked atop Cholula and dreamed of glory. To conquer the descendants of the Spanish conquerors and to plant the flag of our young republic upon the capital reared centuries ago above the ruins of Montezuma's palaces, what prospect more captivating to the youthful imagination? <laughs> 